Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us here for another installment of Media Post's webinar series. I'm John Whitfield, VP of Partnerships here at Media Post. We have a fantastic presentation for you all today from our friends at Trimmer Video and Unruly. Media Post webinars bring together the media, marketing, and advertising community to learn more about the methodologies and the technologies that make effective business possible. And they're brought to you by top solution pro solutions providers and marketers and practitioners in our industry. Today, we're thrilled to have Devin Fallon, Vice President of Media Insights and Analytics at Trimmer Video, and Terrence Scroop, Vice President of Insights and Solutions for the US at Unruly, both here with us today to speak to you about unlocking what consumers really want and how to keep them engaged now and later. After the presentation today, we'll have time for a question and answer session, and you can submit your questions at any time during this presentation in the question box found on the GoToWebinar interface here. Well, with that, if, if I have Devin and Terrence ready here, I'll ask them to take it away. Gentlemen? Thank you, Jim. This is Devin. I lead our client-facing analytics team at Tremor Video. And Tremor's main goal is to help advertisers deliver impactful brand stories across all screens through the power of innovative video technology combined with advanced audience data and captivating creative. Tremor Video is one of the largest and most innovative video advertising companies in North America with offerings in connected TV, in-stream video, and in-app video. And I'm really happy to be here today with Terrence Scroop, Unruly's US VP of Insights and Solutions. Thanks for the intro, Devin. At Unruly, we spent the last decade plus building a unique set of learnings and benchmarks to gauge the intensity of emotion in advertising and the significant impact that factor has on both the short-term and long-term elements of consumer engagement and brand building. We've traditionally focused our attention on digital video screens, and it's exciting with Tremor and Unruly's recent merger to see how we can extend our body of research into the, into the dynamic and swiftly growing connected TV universe. We appreciate you all joining us today under these fairly unusual circumstances. Some of you may remember Robert Kelly and his family from a BBC News interview in 2017, but I don't think anyone would have imagined we'd all be feeling like him a few short years later. My daughter has responded remarkably well to being stuck in the house with us for the last month and a half going on too, but there's something alluring about a laptop screen with a dozen faces on it that I think just begs for human interaction. Hopefully though, we won't have any interruptions today since we have some timely and valuable information to get through. The focus of this webinar has certainly evolved over the last few weeks as our professional and personal lives have been affected in both mundane and dramatic ways. But at its core, we'll be exploring consumer behavior in light of recent and upcoming privacy focused legislation, as well as the life changing impacts of COVID-19, the value exchange between brands and consumers, and key strategies and tactics for adapting in an industry that's always been famous for change and now finds that pace of change accelerating faster than ever. A little stage setting, here are just a few of the major events that have led us to today and that will guide and impact our decision-making in the months and years to come. GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, stands out as the first major legislative push behind giving consumers more insight into and control over the data they generate through online behaviors. And between GDPR's adoption and its taking effect, we saw one of many major data breaches in 2017, this one through Equifax, which exposed roughly 147 million consumers' personal information to hackers. It really brought into sharp focus the importance of understanding and regulating what information companies should be allowed to gather and store. Since then, in the absence of federal regulation, individual U.S. states have stepped forward to propose a patchwork of legislation, most notably California's CCPA, or Consumer Privacy Act, and Maine's Consumer Privacy Law. And of course, by 2022, Google is leading the charge to reduce and eliminate our industry's reliance on cookies. So what all of this means is that consumers and advertisers alike will face confusion and uncertainty due to a variety of factors. These include inconsistency in state level data and privacy legislation, consumers waking up to the dangers and risks of data sharing, increasing consumer power to opt out and control their own data, more choices than ever for consumers in the, in the content that they watch, more options than ever for advertisers in the targeting and customization of ads they implement, the impact of major global events like COVID-19 have on every part of our lives, and the elimination of legacy tracking and targeting technology. 
All this uncertainty can make it difficult for advertisers to understand how they can effectively speak to their audiences without running afoul of privacy legislation, consumer sentiment, or both. What we've uncovered, however, is that consumers don't mind sharing data when it's used to enhance the relevance and engagement of their ad experience while respecting their privacy. The key to mastering this value exchange is adapting the message provided to consumers, making sure it's customized based not only on personal preference, but external factors such as COVID-19. Modern streaming video consumers understand and appreciate the explicit value exchange of free, ad-supported and rewarded content. And this understanding can translate to more positive perception of ads in ad-supported video on demand environments or AVOD environments. And lastly, mobile and connected TV environments, which were largely cookie free to begin with, are inherently less susceptible to the challenges introduced by cookie de deprecation, leaving these screens well positioned to deliver against valuable brand audiences. To support these findings, we turn to a variety of sources, including leveraging some of the invaluable insights our unruly colleagues have uncovered over the last several years. Data in this presentation comes from a dedicated Tremor Privacy and Customization Consumer Survey from December 2019, run in conjunction with Taluna. We're also pulling from Tremor Creative Studio's extensive expertise and experience in working with brands to create engaging custom ad experience. On the Unruly side, we have taken our strength in panel research and adjusted our approach slightly over the past few months to learn more about how consumer behaviors and ad-related attitudes have shifted as we all learn to live through these strange days of COVID-19. Our initial consumer study was in the week of March 25th to understand how consumers had changed their day-to-day -day schedules and lifestyles. Specifically, what those changes meant for their media usage, as well as the lens through which people felt brands and advertisements had a role to play. Our second study was fielded in mid-April, focusing on 14 brand ads that were in various ways crafted to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Consumers were surveyed on a variety of brand KPIs, as well as the intensity to which they felt strong emotional reactions to the creative and the appropriateness of the creative approach. So first and foremost, while many within the industry have hailed CCPA as a major wake up call to advertisers and consumers alike, I think it's important to point out that a majority of consumers are familiar with advertiser tactics for delivering more personalized and customized advertising with 73% of respondents claiming to be familiar or very familiar. Now, there are of course many shades of explicit and implicit targeting and custom creative executions, which will be, but we've come a long way from the old days of mass reach media like TV, radio, print, and out of home, which were typically at best targetable by broad geography or con Not Surprisingly, younger demographics claim greater familiarity Though, as you can see, even 57% of adults 55 plus answered in the affirmative to this question. A few other groups that stood out here were those with high household income, heavy TV and digital viewers, and those subscribing to SVOD or subscription video on demand services like Netflix or Hulu, VMBPD services. These are virtual multi-channel video programming distributors, quite a mouthful, but these are streaming services that offer access to live linear TV, like Sling TV and AT&T. In these strong baseline awareness levels, there's also a high degree of comfort with personalized approaches to advertising. Though, of course, that comfort will vary depending on the degree of personalization, the demographic composition of your audience, and perhaps most importantly, whether the viewer perceives value from the messaging. Overall, 63% of respondents held a favorable opinion of rewarded or incentivized ads. Demographics that were in general more comfortable across the spectrum of ad and targeting customization were Gen X and high household income groups. What we can see here is that comfort levels were at their uniform highest when consumers were being offered personalized special offers, which is the most explicitly value-based selection here, implying some sort of reduced cost or other economic incentive. Next were ads that were tailored to a viewer's specific interest or needs, and ads customized based on geography or weather, before moving to tactics that could be considered uh, perhaps a little more intimate or even intrusive. Ads featuring specific products previously searched for, ads that are served to the same user across a variety of digital devices, and ads incorporating personal information directly into the creative, also known as the minority report approach. That last approach is a bridge too far for nearly two thirds of respondents 
though interestingly, 57% of households with income over $150,000 were comfortable even with this degree of personalization. It's hard to know exactly why, but one bit of speculation could be a certain sense of pride among high earners that they've worked hard to get to where they are, and they expect and welcome their advertising to reflect their status, with ads and offers tied to upscale goods like luxury cars, exotic vacations, and expensive electronics. But the broader point here is that it's important for brands to find the precise point at which their approach becomes too custom, and that point will vary widely based on their audience. We thought it would be helpful to provide some examples of targeting creative executions that leverage audience data to illustrate where that fine line may exist for your brand. From a targeting perspective, in a broad sense, we're able to focus our media on contextual alignment based on surfing behavior, linear and digital viewing, geography, and weather. From a more personal perspective, we think about tactics like retargeting based on specific on brand sites, specific product searches, which is probably relatable for anyone who has ever used Amazon, and identifying digital devices that belong to the same user to drive frequency or support sequential messaging. From a creative perspective, we can subtly tailor the look and feel of our messaging based on previous content genres for which our audience has shown an affinity. In this example, the end card for the movie trailer for All I See Is You used different copy and different color palettes depending on the viewer's established interests, which were highlighted in the black boxes at the and more specifically, we can leverage on-site actions or search history to determine the key features that may be of interest to a car shopper, as you see here, with knowledge of their income level or prior purchase versus lease history, we can provide incentives and offers that fit their needs. Now, all these are examples of creative decisions we can make based on a viewer's prior actions, but there's an entirely separate and additional layer of customization we can make based on viewers' emotional reactions to current events or the creative itself. You're right, Devin. We can also glean valuable insights by adapting the ways in which we observe consumer reactions and responses. One of the most powerful tools we utilize to inform our creative editing is biometric data in the form of facial coding. We use this data to analyze consumer reaction to creatives on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. This allows us to understand precisely when a consumer is showing surprise or disgust to the visuals and dialogue in the advertisement. And we know exactly when a consumer is fully engaged or beginning to tune out. What we're looking at in this slide is one example of this type of data, what we call a facial trace. In this case, we are showing the presence of smiles during the run of Nike's now iconic Dream Crazy ad featuring Colin Kaepernick. The color coding is in place to differentiate the traces for three geographical regions in the US the Northeast, the Southeast, and the Midwest. And I'll tell you why we're breaking them out this way. Now, as some of us may remember, this particular ad campaign was launched to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Just Do It slogan. And there was much debate in the trade press as to why the brand had chosen Kaepernick as their lead spokesperson, given the polarizing debate that surrounded him and his highly publicized political positions. When we studied this ad globally, we uncovered some very disparate emotional reactions with positive emotions like pride and inspiration coming in strongly in various markets, but also discovering that contempt and even disgust registered specifically in the US market. When we dug even deeper and analyzed those reactions within the US on a regional basis, we discovered that the negative emotions were present only in some geographic regions and actually weren't generally focused on Kaepernick, but rather on a wide variety of themes and characters presented in the nearly two minute anthem ad. So diving into one of these regional traces in more detail, we can take a look at the Northeast and the specific sections of Dream Crazy that really pop for consumers in that region. This biometric data helps us to contextualize the responses we receive in our surveys. And together, those two systems of data help us decipher what images, characters, and portions of the narrative have real appeal. And it often goes far deeper than simply featuring the right team jersey. We've had great success advising our clients away from confusing narratives, identifying underrepresentation or lack of brand clarity, and in the case of a lengthy anthem ad like Dream Crazy, how to effectively cut that creative down to the most impactful 15 or even six second ad, a vital tool as we are constantly competing for shorter and shorter attention spans. To address the here and now of brand messaging, let's shift over to some of the results from our recent consumer survey covering attitudes and behaviors during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
one of the key concerns we've heard from our clients from the onset of the coronavirus outbreak was, should they be advertising at this time and how should they manage their response? Not surprisingly, a huge percent, percentage of brands did pause or decrease their spending in the immediate response to self distancing and isolation orders. But the actual results we collected from our respondents painted quite a different picture in regards to consumer mindsets. For nearly every age group we polled, the most common response for how marketers should be messaging at this time was for brands to either address how they will be planning to support staff and customers or provide informative messages about COVID-19. Not far behind those two options was the desire for advertising to either entertain with funny and happy messaging or to simply carry on as normal. Now, on the flip side, we found that on average, only 2% of Americans felt that world events warranted a complete pause to advertising. Shifting into the second study I mentioned that focused on COVID-19 centric ads, we can see some of the suggested approaches from our attitudinal survey already taking shape. This first chart shows how all of the 14 videos we tested, none of them really fell below our US benchmark for brand favorability. And in fact, most all of them managed to show a significant uplift. The results of our larger study actually showed that four out of five of our lead brand KPIs for these COVID-19 ads outperformed the standard US norm, brand recall being the sole exception to the rule. So given the results of that chart, we thought we would look at the best performing of this set of ads and break down some of the elements that made Budweiser's one team such a strong contender in terms of improving brand favorability. First off, the ad leans into heritage, nostalgia, and Americana, which helped to drive a variety of strong emotional responses. Inspiration and happiness in particular registering significantly for more than one in five respondents. Second, the creative here artfully alludes to our common fondness for professional sports, which are sadly absent from our current day to day. And it segues that messaging into a larger philanthropic message about how Budweiser is reconstituting that sports sponsorship money into funding for the Red Cross. And speaking of the Red Cross, in a scenario such as this, drafting off of a more relevant and topical player, like a relief organization, is a smart way to boost brand equity without seeming predatory. But the trade-off here can be brand recall. As we found in the case of this ad, a significant percentage of our respondents mistakenly identified this ad as being attributed to the Red Cross. The point of these examples is to reinforce the value of being adaptable with your creative. Whether that means adjusting your creative to account for regional nuance or pivoting to address real world events on the fly, understanding and leveraging the right emotional tone is key to standing out from the crowd and connecting with your consumers. So, I'm sure some of our listeners are finding all of this very interesting, but wondering in the back of their mind, why is it so important to lean into emotions with my advertising? Where are the proof points? Well, at Unruly, we've spent the last few years conducting extensive testing of our own, as well as with trusted academics and institutions to further validate the connection between emotional responses to advertising and real world outcomes. As represented by this chart, you can see that Nielsen's consumer neuroscience study found that ads with above average electroencephalogram scores delivered a 23% lift on sales volume. So in layman's terms, emotional ads are literally stimulating the brain in an entirely different way than your run of the mill ads. We also worked with Peter Field in an extensive study last year to decipher the metrics associated with long and short term business success, discovering that those key emotions and responses are very different for those two goals. Positive psychological responses correlated with long-term business effects like profit, differentiation, and brand fame. And we also found that amazement and exhilaration were two emotions in particular that were most consistently linked to effectiveness. Hopefully by now it's clear that there are a variety of ways Tremor and Unruly can leverage audience data and insights to create the most relevant, impactful, and ultimately valuable experience possible for our viewers. And in doing so, we can establish lasting relationships with those consumers. Now, beyond the potential disruption of consumer privacy legislation, the long foretold death of the cookie has been accelerated by Google's announcement earlier this year. This of course means we will have to continue to innovate our approaches and leverage our wealth of proprietary knowledge, but we're not the only ones who have been forced to adapt.
Fortunately, a bright spot within this challenging new climate is that environments less conducive to cookies may find themselves better positioned to remain competitive in the long run due to their continued ability to identify and engage valuable users at scale. Mobile and connected TV in particular, with their heavier reliance on persistent device or household specific IDs, will retain many of the same targeting and creative capabilities they utilize today. And helpfully, as it pertains to audience engagement, these devices retain an edge as well. Connected TV, a hybrid of the content of linear mixed with the targeting, customization, and measurement capabilities of digital, enjoys a reputation that straddles those lines as well. Somewhat surprisingly to us, younger and middle-aged viewers were the most likely to identify connected TV as being indistinguishable from cable or satellite TV to the tune of 52% of adult 18 to 34-year-olds and 54% of 35 to 54-year-olds. To the majority of these audiences, wherever they can find the content they want to watch, be it traditional TV or TV through a connected device, is where they park themselves. And it's helpful to remember that outside our media and marketing bubble, the distinction between linear and connected TV is not nearly so stark as we imagine it to be. That being said, at the same time that the lines between linear and digital continue to be blurred, these same audiences acknowledge some of the explicit benefits that come with the digital approach to TV. Around two thirds of both 18 to 34 year olds and 35 to 54 year olds prefer the convenience and content availability of connected TV to linear TV. And at an audience wide level, viewers are 4% more likely to feel that ads on connected TV have been selected for compared to linear TV. 3% less likely to feel that CTV ads are disruptive and 4% less likely for audiences to shift away attention during ads. On the mobile front, we've long known that this most personal and close at hand of devices is one that viewers lean into. And there are some important ways we can ensure continued engagement on the small screen. You're right, Devin. One undeniable trend in digital consumption has been the increasing shift of time spent on mobile devices. And as online video has become more prevalent, consumers have also trained themselves to experience video content without sound. Now, we as consumers have made this accommodation for a number of reasons. In some cases, it's for convenience. In others, out of necessity of not having a private space or headphones readily available, or even to avoid potential embarrassment. Recent eMarketer stats showed that over 80% of online video is watched with sound off. And when we follow that migration over to mobile, we see that stack get even larger, with 92% of all mobile online video being watched without sound. So in this regard, we wanted to highlight another interesting study we conducted, which, which highlights how we can utilize our research approach to optimize creative and account for ever-changing consumer behaviors. To understand how we might be able to combat this pervasive behavior, we structured a two-part test. We took a set of campaign creative and ran half as originally intended with full audio tracks and the other half were edited by Unruly's in-house creative team to, be, to include subtitling and be stripped of their audio. Our hypothesis was that the sound on version might slightly outperform the subtitled version, but it wouldn't fall too far behind in terms of driving brand KPIs. What we actually found was quite the opposite, with the subtitled version consistently outperforming the original version of the ad. Now, this first test was conducted in a closed environment, which inherently has a degree of influence on panelist responses. So we recreated the test in a live environment where we took the original sound on creative and optimized towards sound on inventory. And the creatives we edited with subtitles were allowed to run across our network. In this second phase of the test, we found that the subtitled version of the creative continued to hold their own, fluctuating only plus or minus three percentage points from the original creative in terms of those brand KPIs. Statistically speaking, it was a dead heat. Given what we know about the high percentage of ads being watched without sound and the fact that adding in simple subtitling can preserve what would otherwise be lost brand engagements, the future best practice might be to always adapt your creative for a silent environment. This is just another example of how we help our clients adapt to the changing marketplace and make sure that every impression has the opportunity to realize its full potential. Thanks. So after all is said and done, it may be helpful to take a step back and understand what tactics advertisers may lose in this brave new world and what tactics will still be available to them. From a marketing perspective, we're likely to lose scale in some third party audiences that rely on cookies. But on the flip side, we'll still be able to leverage contextual alignment, geographic, day parting, first party CRM data, and persistent 
identifiers like IP uh, and IP. And from a creative perspective, we'll likely see fewer triggers for dynamic creative optimization and data-driven video, but messaging can still be customized based on indicators like geography, time of day, device, and persistent identifiers gleaned through first-party data, device IDs, and other sources. If you're looking for a few ideas on the best way to take advantage of these opportunities, here are a few thought starters. Dynamic creative optimization and, and data-driven video both rely on a variety of tr triggers to tweak and tailor creative messaging to resonate most highly with each individual viewer. And we expect to continue to be able to leverage these opportunities even in. Second, the linear-like environment of connected TV alongside the power of ACR, automatic content recognition technology, to make targeting decisions based on linear content viewership will continue to provide important audience scale in a cookie-less world. Contextual alignment, one of the most tried and true methods for audience targeting, may see a renewed focus. And finally, don't underestimate the value of connecting with your consumers on a deeper psychological level. Positioning your brand to make an emotional connection with viewers sets your brand up for long-term rewards. It's also not as simple as finding a perfect emotion to focus all of your messaging around. Our research on, emotion, on the emotional landscape is ever-changing. Our extensive database allows us to continuously track the collective temperature of our nation's psyche. And the results vary greatly between industry verticals and different audience groups. We can detect when seasonal patterns emerge, as well as longer term fluctuations relative to macro factors that influence our collective outlook. For example, two prominent features of 2020, a presidential election and a global health crisis. It'll be interesting to see how the events of today play out and influence the preference of certain emotions in the months and years ahead for American consumers. So we've taken you through quite a lot today in a pretty short amount of time. So we wanna hone in on a few key points for you before we wrap up. We found that a majority of viewers, around 72%, are familiar with advertiser abilities to target and customize messaging to them. And more than 50% of viewers are comfortable with ads relying on a variety of customization factors outside of personal information. For certain audiences, even personal information may be acceptable. So it's important to understand where the line exists for your brand's audience. Modern streaming video consumers understand and appreciate the explicit value exchange of free ad supported and rewarded content. With 63% of audiences providing a positive impact, opinion of rewarded ad experiences. And this understanding may translate to more positive perceptions of ads in ad-supported video on-demand environments. Uh, also, mobile and connected TV environments, largely cookie-free to begin with, are inherently less susceptible to the challenges introduced by cookie deprecation. And finally, understanding the motivations and emotional state of your audience is a vital element to ensuring your brand is going to stand out and thrive. We hope you found this content enlightening and we encourage you to reach out to your designated Tremor or Enrolee account contacts to learn more about how our company can help you best adapt your business to the ever-changing landscape of video privacy and customization. Thank you. We'd now like to open it up for questions from Tremor's content manager, Frank Pesquini. Thanks guys, that was great. Uh, really appreciate that. So yeah, we have a few questions coming in. Um, the first one for you here is, how can we work with your team to elevate our EEG scores? Um, would this require a complete edit of our videos or are there ways in which you can help us optimize across screens? Sure, I'll answer that one. Um, so first off, the EEG score is not a standard part of our brand KPI that was tied to a specific measure, but we do still understand the emotional intensity in every single ad that we test. So we do have a battery of emotions, positive, negative, cognitive, primal that we track, and we are able to benchmark those against specific audience groups, specific verticals, and at a country or regional level even. Um, the other part of your question as to whether or not we need to do a full edit, Oftentimes we find there are little tactical elements that we can tweak or emphasize more of. So we don't have to entirely reshoot an ad. And we do have at Unruly our own in-house creative team that can make those changes on the fly. So you don't have to send it back to full production um, reworking. But we can also make a whole variety of different cuts of a, of a given ad. It all very much depends upon the need of the given campaign 
and how much opportunity there is essentially to kind of spread the wealth and see how many different versions we can produce. And then one other thing that we can also offer on top of that is after we've done the initial analysis of the ad and have our editing recommendations in place, we can make those edits and then retest to see if we are actually amplifying those various brand KPIs, including that intense emotional level. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question here it says, we understand that a lot of people are shifting to CTV, but what is the best approach to ensure you're reaching both CTV, connected TV, and linear TV viewers without oversaturating them? Uh, this is Devin. I, I can take that one. I think it largely is going to depend on first your core target audience, um, both in your brand brief as well as on linear TV, who you're buying. And secondly, I think it's going to depend a lot on your KPIs. Typically, uh, the approach that we see a lot of our advertisers taking uh, is to either maximize their overlap with linear TV, in which case we would be working with the same demo targeting uh, that a linear TV team is buying on. We'd be looking at retargeting based off of exposure to that brand's existing messaging on linear TV. Or we could be looking at heavy media consumers. On the flip side, we oftentimes have advertisers looking to uh, minimize the overlap. In other words, maximize the incremental reach uh, of their connected TV audience. And in those cases, we would do uh, very much the opposite of the tactics I just described. We would look to negatively retarget based off of viewers who have already seen the ad on TV. We could look to light TV or non-TV viewers or cord cutters. And all of these would be ways for us to try to optimize our connected TV plan away from the audience that was already exposed on linear TV. As I mentioned, though, I think a lot of it comes down uh, to the, the objectives of the campaign. In many cases, it does make sense to cast as wide a net as possible uh, with your digital buy, particularly if you are fairly saturated with your audience's reach curve on linear TV and you're trying to pick up your last 5, 10, or 15 percent of audience reach uh, and drive broad awareness. In other cases, though, it may help to drive your frequency uh, of your linear TV audience with your digital messaging, where, as we've seen today, you can sometimes provide a little more customization or even a push towards the middle or bottom of the funnel to build on the, the high upper funnel branding that you've already created with your linear TV buy. Okay, thank you. Um, a few more rolling in here. Uh, this one says, I understand how you measure emotional reactions to ads, but what protocol do you use to help brands define what emotion they should be aiming for? Is it an emotional strategy? Yeah, um, I'll take that one, Terrence. So uh, part of what I had mentioned a couple of times during the presentation was that we at Unruly have a massive database of testing. We're testing thousands of videos every year. And so what that provides us with is really a broad view of not just country level information, but also specific industry verticals and understanding exactly what the makeup and landscape looks like in any given industry. And so for certain industries like personal care, you're going to want to lean into certain emotions that are very different from a financial services company. So what we can do and what we work with our clients to understand is what does that emotional landscape look like? at an industry level or however they want us to define it. Maybe it's about a specific audience group. And what we can do is tap into that database of testing we've done previously and really give them the lay of the land. This is what everybody, your close competitors are doing. This is what the industry that you're in trends towards. And that helps us define if there is a white space perhaps that's not being fully utilized, if there is a core area where, where everyone is chasing after and so the message might get muddled and what we've seen happen sometimes is that when you have a lot of close competitors, if they're trying to send out the same type of messaging, oftentimes that leads to lower brand recall and so you can see um, three or four different really close competitors be misidentified in the same ad because the look and feel and the emotional tenor of what they're putting out there is really so similar. So it helps us to advise them in terms of how to differentiate themselves and make sure they're standing out and also a, a degree of ranking also like like I said before all of our studies show you benchmarks that can be at the specific industry and audience level so how well are they measuring up to another competitor are they really doing so much better or is it kind of a draw in that regard and should they perhaps pivot and find a different space to capitalize on okay thanks Terrence um I think we have time for one more question. I just want to let everyone on the on the webinar know that 
we are recording this and you will all be receiving this. Um, we're also keeping track of the questions rolling in so we can answer them individually after this webinar if we do not get to yours. Um, so with that said, one more question here. It says, for ad customizations, is there a limit as to how many versions you can create? What do you guys recommend? Um, I'll go first, and, and Devin, if you have any thoughts, feel free to chime in. Um, not really a limit. Um, we'll always work with our clients to advise them in terms of if they don't have a, um, a hard focus in terms of what they can allow for in terms of their campaign setup or funding or what have you, we can ha always work and advise them in terms of what the best protocol is. And again, that's going to vary a lot depending upon the industry and the complexity of the message they're trying to deliver and if it's sequential or something of that sort. Um, but no, no, no hard limit and no, no best practice in that regard. We really have to evaluate on a case by case basis. Um, and there's no limit on our side either. We can really work with any of our, our clients um, to kind of come up with the best possible solution that fits their needs. Yeah, I think you covered it really well, Terrence. I guess the, the one distinction I would make would be between um, pre-campaign testing and, and in-campaign testing. And I think in-campaign testing, similar to Terrence's point, we would just want to make sure that however many different creatives we're putting into the market, we have the means to effectively test uh, the outcomes of those, of those creative changes, be it through traditional KPIs like completion rate or click-through rate, or through uh, brand lift metrics like awareness, favorability, intent, even something like offline sales. So a lot of uh, thought would just have to go into the campaign setup to make sure we were effectively measuring uh, as many of those creative changes as we possibly could. Okay, I think that that just about wraps it up for us. Before I hand things back over to Media Post, I just really love to thank all the folks over at Media Post for hosting us, and especially want to thank all of you who joined us today. Um, we hope that you got something informative out of this and really appreciate you joining and your attention and time. Great. Thanks, you guys. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, Devin, Terrence, thanks for a great presentation. Um, Frank, thanks for fielding the questions. And, um, and as Frank mentioned, you guys will all receive a copy of this um, in your inboxes tomorrow, so look out for that. Um, <clears throat> just want to thank um, quickly everyone behind the scenes at the marketing departments here uh, at Trimmer Video as well as at Unruly who uh, put all this together. And uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Stay tuned um, to Media Post's website and, uh, and in your inbox um, for, for more informative webinars just like this one from other valuable partners as we go here. And, uh, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. We'll, we'll get through all this together. Um, but again, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. I uh, hope you learned something and we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. <laughs>